Well, this presentation is probably a little diverse because, of course, once I got started, I realized how much there was there. And I really don't know if I've covered it adequately. But, and you know where I'm beginning with the wonderful quote, what is utopia? A dream unrealized, but not unrealizable. The utopia of Galileo is now truth. The utopia of Columbus exists. A new world, America, has risen from the depths of the ocean. All innovative ideas were utopias at their birth, but developing them makes them enter the world of the real. Alchemy did not succeed in making gold but it drew from its crucible something more precious. So it goes on. When the idea had finished speaking, I asked her for the secret of future times, the magical delights of the Harmonian world, writes de Jacques. The Harmonian world, of course, is a concept and major theme of Charles Fourier. Fourier originated the concept of passional attraction and wrote, passion and sexuality that the Bible teaches us as evil, the reason for expulsion from Eden is truly the divine principle. Passion draws persons to come together and form associations, just as gravity organizes celestial bodies into solar systems, galaxies, universes. Fourier wrote that work could become pleasure if motivated by passional attractions. This would cause a transformation of the social world and humanity would live in harmony, hopefully peace and prosperity too. This question of social norms and this utopian hope for the future find a perennial expression. Recently, one sees such thinking surface in last year's considering of the future of work. One finds it in the publication of Abigail Sussex's book, Surrealist Sabotage and the War on Work. An editorial also written by Sussex on work was printed in the New York Times and widely reprinted. She elaborates in her questioning of how work and its products should be distributed in our society. This questioning is at the heart of de Jacques work and is speculative utopian thinking brought into our modern world. Why work? How should we live if computers and robots take over production and workers are no longer needed? How should goods be distributed? Our age, similar to the Industrial Revolution, brings new promises, new problems. Now, back in Chicago, our crypto surrealist solidarity bookshop group, then in a rundown Lincoln Park, reprinted Lafargue's Right to be Lazy in the 1960s. This was written by Karl Marx's son-in-law in 1882. The title, The Right to be Lazy, demands leisure be one of the rights of mankind. This light-hearted social critique was recently reprinted with an introduction by one of our group, Bernard Marzalek, and soon, may be brought out by a commercial publisher. Marzalek often writes on the relationship of work and play on his Zetengi website. He calls for an epidemic of joy to counteract the toxic diet of economic nonsense that starves the impulse to build a better way to live. And reminds us of Jean Huizinga's important book, Homo Ludens. Now, de Jacques' great work, The Humanosphere, lays out both a social critique and a vision for the future. What method did de Jacques use in his speculations? He writes, social science proceeds by inductions and deductions, and knowledge. By a series of comparisons, it arrives at a combination of truth. I will proceed by analogy. De Jacques quotes Fourier at length, so we know he was familiar with his work. And the analogy was the method chosen by Charles Fourier. And it is also used by surrealism in elaborating the correspondences that refresh language and thought. This is really long. Just 
If you have a question, you can interrupt, I guess. In the 1800s, Fourier was well known as was Robert Owen in England and became the subsequent utopian thought discussed by Marx and Engels in socialism, utopian and scientific. In the US, Fourier became well known thanks to Albert Brisbane, who edited the Felix in 1843 and later Harbinger in 1845. The journal moving to New York under control of George Ripley and Charles Anderson Dana. Hundreds of communities were based on utopian ideas, mostly those of Fourier and Owen. The well-known book farm, largely intellectuals, did not last long. Another in Green Bay, Wisconsin was quite successful and seems to have broken up only when younger generations had different needs. In another attempt at utopia, quite near where I live and 20 miles north of Chicago, Seth Payne, abolitionist, following the principles of Charles Fourier, founded the town of Lake Zurich in 1836. Later moving back to Chicago, he founded a bank of the people on the principles of Proudhon and a women's shelter. A book called The Anointed One was recently published on his life, written by a woman local researcher, Nancy Schum. In England and France, the industrial age brought a search for ways to reorganize and transform everyday life. The industrial age with the smoke-filled, toxic, crowded cities that were disease-ridden, spewed pollution, death, disease, and accident were constant companions. As there are many avenues to explore in this complex scientific, industrial, and cultural transformation that swirled around De Jacques that are also key to surrealism, let's look more, local, more closely at some of these years. Now, in 1859, my relatives arrived in the US. What made them leave the Prague area, then part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire? Was it disappointed idealism in the face of the 1848 revolutions? Too many wars in Europe? A war involving British, French, the Ottoman Empire, and Piedmont, Sardinia against Russia and Crimea had ended in 1856. A second war of Italian independence with Sardinia pitted Austria against, uh, AKA the Holy Roman, Holy Roman Empire against Sardinia. Sardinia won. In 1859 in North Italy, Giuseppe Garibaldi's volunteers called the Hunters of the Alps defeated the Holy Roman Empire at the battles of Varese and Como, opening up the gate to Italian unification. But very important in 1859, a milestone in human thought, Darwin's Origin of the Species by Means of Natural Selection was published on November 24, 1859. Forever changing our view of the natural world and challenging the basic ideas of religion. This idea, the transmutation of species by natural selection, by chance, not by divine interference, fitted into the broader discussion of evolutionary mechanisms within the social world, and the idea that human society might also have evolution and social improvements. Revolution, excuse me, uh, the enlightened de Jacques thinks that uh, all sorts of synthesis of errors were embodied in religion, ancient and modern errors. The affirmation of absolute arbitrariness, the petrification of the past is what he called it. He advises that so long as we have not destroyed God, heaven, his power and his satellite church on earth, we have not revolutionized deism. Critiquing the link between government, religion, property, and family, he wrote, religion is the barometer of public reason. It does nothing but indicate through its formulas the general degree of elevation or abasement of human knowledge. Besides communities established by followers of Fourier, Etienne Cabet established his own in 1848 in Texas, but soon was forced to move to Nauvoo, Illinois. He had written and published Utopia Ideas in Voyage to Arcaria. 
in 1838. Cabet died in 1856, the same year that de Jacques arrived in the US and began writing his Humanosphere. LSA Reclus too was in New Orleans beginning 1853, writing his impressions, a fragment of a voyage to New Orleans. He would take part in the Paris Commune in 1871 and was banished from France in 1872. He wrote La Nouvelle Géographie Universale and was awarded the gold medal by the Paris Geographical Society, although he was in exile. An anarchist who saw geography as connected to geology related to human society, lives, and livelihoods and nationalism. In 1859, one finds de Jacques in New York having established his newspaper, Le Libertaire Journal du Mouvement Social. It is the year of John Brown's raid on October 16. De Jacques writes and prints in Le Libertaire a passionate defense of Brown. In his article, The Slavery War, de Jacques writes, John Brown is the Spartacus who called the modern helot slaves to break their irons, the blacks to take up arms. His banner of revolt has sunk in blood. That banner was that of liberty, and I salute it, and I kiss its bloody folds. I proclaim my moral complicity, my solidarity with all its acts. Brown is a heroic fanatic. The foray of John Brown is good, and that the story will resound with echoes upon echoes in the most remote shanties. It will stir the independent streak of slaves. It will dispose them to action. It will be a recruiting agent. So the American Civil War began officially on April 12, 1861. But Previous to this, William Lloyd Garrison had been publishing his anti-slavery journal, The Liberator, since 1831 in Boston. And he was just as earnest. In fact, he says, I am in earnest. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will not retreat a single inch and I will be heard. No compromise was his idea. Liberation was the cause of the day and the time had come to end slavery. De Jacques was a militant thinker. He joined the struggle with his journal of libertaire. And I think there is not an accident that it was provoked by this American struggle. In the pages De Jacques published, uh, the struggle even further, including women, and he published in his Humanosphere as a series. His journal only lasted a few years, but that was not the end of it. La Libertaire was revived by others in Algeria in 1891, in Brussels in 1893, and relaunched in Paris by Sebastian Farr and Louise Michel. Then it returned again in 1944, and currently it's published in France and online as Le Monde Libertaire. The Holy Family by Marx and Engels actually attacked on young Hegelians, not the family. Ingalls devotes an entire section to Flora Tristan in her, her book, The Workers' Union, 1843. Tristan argued that the struggles of workers would never succeed if they failed to include women, that workers produce everything, yet they have no rights, no possessions, nothing at all. She called for them to consider themselves a class. Ingalls defended her ideas in the Holy Family against attack by Hegelian Bruno Bauer, who considered Tristan's thought feminine dogmatism. Engel goes even further to defend love. To quote Engels on Tristan, he says, states, the worker creates nothing because his work remains individual, fragmented piecework, produces nothing whole. His individual needs are its only object. In the present world system, the branches of labor are separated or even opposed to one another, not organized. He goes on to say, the seeds of this proposition first appeared in Flora Tristan's work. Tristan who had met and influenced 
was influenced herself by Charles Fourier's idea, was prominent just before the 1848 revolution, the time both de Jacques and Eliphaz Levy were imprisoned for political reasons. Flora Tristan became well known after she left an abusive husband, was shot by him, but survived. She befriended Levy and that was when he was still Abbe Constant, but questioning God and religion. He took up an unusual occultism, never really giving up the ideas of Fourier, but developed what Fourier labeled the Kabbalist passion, mystery and intrigue, and uh, explored the history of occultism and its psychology. Secret societies flourished after 1848 especially the Masons. Tristan could be considered following the passion of unityism, according to Fourier, and it felt it was her mission to help organize the workers. On a speaking tour, she died at 40. She left her papers to occultist Eliphaz Levy, who preserved them and had them published. In Wikipedia, de Jacques is listed as a poet. And it was his poetry that had the power to cause his arrest. In the humanosphere, of course, you know de Jacques' powerful rant in the text on, at Tech on Civilization begins, excerpted by me. What is this book? This book is not a literary work. It is an infernal labor, the cry of a rebel slave. This book is not written in ink. Its pages are not sheets of paper. This book is metallic steel, turned in octava, charged with explosive, fulminative ideas. The privileged ones, those who have sown slavery, the hour has come to reap rebellion. This book is not a document, it's an act, not traced by the soft hand of fantasy. This is a book of hate, a book of love. When finds similarity, in the surrealist inspiration Isidore de Casse or Comte de Tremont, especially in mood and intensity of de Jacques' work. Now the surrealists of course came later and they didn't discover Le Tremont until 1917. And it was found by Philippe Sepult in the mathematics section of a small bookstore near the military hospital on the Ile de Saint-Louis. La Tremont de Jacques and Surrealism were influenced, I think, pretty openly by Baudelaire, especially Fleurs de Mal, published in 1857. Interestingly, there was an American influence on Baudelaire. He had discovered Edgar Allan Poe in 1847 and introduced his work to France, translating and publishing Poe's thoughts on st style he used in writing his poem, The Raven. This philosophy of composition was published in 1859, and there have been many translations of The Raven into French. In 1869, Le Tremont, writing in Paris, invented Maldoror, the evil figure, enemy of mankind, enemy of the existing hypocritical order, enemy of children, love, family, religion, and morality who finds fascination and consolation, love with a female shark. A phrase of Le Tremont caught the eye of Surrealists. As beautiful as a chance encounter of a sewing machine and an umbrella on a dissecting table. The Surrealist formulation, beauty must be convulsive or it will not be, explains the impact of Surrealism and is the secret of unlocking the surrealist image. Ducasse died during the siege of Paris and just before the commune of 1871. Probably in New Orleans, you don't think about it, but in Chicago, we realize 1871 was the year of the great Chicago fire. And it destroyed a chunk of Wisconsin also. Uh, it also destroyed the dress shop of Mary Jones who soon remade herself as Mother Jones. Mother Jones has become famous in the 1970s. 
due to a rediscovery by Fred Thompson, the Illinois Labor History Society, and the Charles H. Kerr Company. Now, surrealists have always opposed religion and been active in the struggles of the time toward freedom and social justice. After World War II, Breton looked to Utopia for fresh ideas and to find a history worth having. In Breton's poem, Ode to Charles Fourier, was written in the US, where he had taken refuge. By chance, in New York bookstore, he found an edition of Fourier's works and carried it along, reading and writing commentary on his trips west with Elisa. He included a bit of travelogue. Fourier, I salute you from the Grand Canyon. When I visited Elisa Breton in Paris in 1970, she mentioned that on that trip, she and Andre had stopped in Chicago and stayed in a South Loop hotel with steel doors. From her description, this was most likely Al Capone's old hotel. She and Andre went to the Field Museum where I especially admire the totem poles, both Northwest Coast and New Guinea. On October 5, 1946, Breton writes that he is captivated by Fourier's ideas on passional attraction, absolute doubt, absolute divergence, and the hieroglyphic chart interpretation of society, which based on analogy compares human passions to the functioning of systems of nature and discovers the cardinal junction between poetic preoccupations in literature with the 19th century's ideas for social experiments mentioning that these experiments in living can only remain in their infancy if the problems of culture and motivation are not considered. Recently published a book of Simone de Beauvoir, no, wrong, Simone de Beau, and Andre Breton's correspondence discusses Fourier's unpublished letters on love, which de, de Beau found and were published in 1967. The correspondence was in tune with Breton's thinking after his publication of Eau de Fourier and contributed to the Surrealist Exhibition that opened 1965 at Gallery Lowell. Anti-consumer, anti-religious, attractive work, the right to be lazy, the right to pleasure was its themes. One of the favorite passions of that Fourier named that surrealist love was the butterfly passion, the need for a variety. In action, this would mean that you would do various kinds of work during the day and year, so tasks would never be stale, but also live in different places and see different people. Breton returned to France in April 1947, and André Julien and Serge Nin of the journal Le Libertaire welcomed his return. The cultural atmosphere in Paris was hostile to surrealism and dominated by an unimaginative existentialism and morbid Stalinism. Breton, Paré, and many of the surrealists found a sympathetic welcome at Le Libertaire, which Camus had also written for. The surrealists wrote a weekly column for 30 issues, Le Billet Surrealiste. This Le Libertaire is the descendant of de Jacques' publication. After World War II, the Surrealist group began reorganizing exhibitions, and the group decided to devote one to Charles Fourier. Georges Sabag concludes his piece on Fourier in the International Encyclopedia of Surrealism. If Surrealism had had a model to follow, they would have chosen Fourier's model from the onset. The exhibition entitled A Car Absolu in Paris in 1965 can be translated, of course, absolute divergence or absolute break. I was there in, and in the most surrealist of all ways, by chance, having been deported from London with Franklin Rosemont and then discovering a poster in the window of a bookstore. From our hotel in Rue Dauphine, it was a short stroll down Rue Saint-André-des-Arts to Rue Seguier to Galerie Loire. 
In the already dark evening, a doorway led to a surrealist paradise. Max Walter Svonberg art glittered in the entry, and an umbrella made of sponges hang from the ceiling. The disordinator with its lighted window boxes took up a wall. Mimi Perron, Toyan, Jean-Claude Silverman, Leonore Carrington, Elishinsky, Benoit. Startling wonders hanging on the dark walls. And in the center of it all, the consumer, a giant pink mattress monster containing a TV and a washing machine enclosed in gross overfed pink stuffing topped with a halo of police sirens. Later, I attended a Surrealist New Year's Eve party and Surrealist meetings. Met Andre and Elisa Breton, sat next to Mamie Courant. I was at the meeting where the Surrealists chose the name for their new journal, L'Archebra, a strange and poetic idea of Fourier, a prehensile tale with an eye on the end, which could improve life, I suppose. For me, Charles Fourier has been familiar since I was in high school, but not well known. I read science fiction concerning dystopias, Brave New World, Time Machine, Iron Heel, Animal Farm. But this left the question, what is utopia? What went wrong? What was social organization? How and why did it change? Could we change our world and improve it? Or were we entirely at the mercy of greater forces? So my encounter with Fourier, also in Martin Buber's pet, Utopia, Marcuse's Eros and Civilization, Marie Louise Bruneri's excellent journey through Utopia. Bruneri was part of the Freedom Press bookstore and group in London and comments on Fourier's wealth of ideas is an inexhaustible source of inspiration for social reformers. His anticipation of garden cities, market gardening, rather than mega agriculture, attractive work, education, women's rights, sexual freedom. He coined the word feminism and pointing out that the progress of civilization should be judged by the status of women. So what would be the next stage of our society? Consumerism was a reply of the situationists. They were correct. As a surrealist society after two world wars and a war in Indochina and Algeria was increasingly utopian, a giant pink mattress for everyone. We brought back situationist literature from Paris and put it in our bookstore window. And still, I didn't realize the onslaught of junk products we face today. Also, an internet once quite valuable, now cluttered with junk info, telephones useless because of junk robocalls, and the unspeakable junk of Twitter. Situation ex examined the idea of spectacle back then, mostly TV and Hollywood. Today, it totally surrounds us with a bottomless pit of stale recorded music, giant sports events, blood drenched TV series and the really big cash cow, increasingly the spectacle of politics itself. One sordid drama after another, performed by mummified monsters trying to drag us back into the crypt of slavery. Our bookstore group evolved towards surrealism and published the first manifesto in August, 1966. Situationist ideas are available today through the Bureau of Public Secrets online, edited by Ken Nab. And, you know, we particularly appreciate Raoul Vanegam, who wrote commenting on our society. Fourier long ago exposed this methodological myopia. The mass of details obscures the totality. Everything is said about the society except what it really is a society dominated by commodities and spectacles. In an essay, Lemonade Oceans and Modern Times by Hakim Bey, explains the importance of Fourier as one of the great apostles of freedom and desires and compares him to Desaad and Blake. To quote Fourier, he says, out of context is to betray him. Lemonade Ocean, the idea must be seen 
in the context of grand and brilliant cosmological speculations as break lakes prophecies. The universe is composed of living beings, planets, and stars who feel passion and carry out sexual intercourse so that creation itself is continual. Passion regarded as evil is in fact the divine principle. Surrealist Don Lacoste, writing for the fifth estate, Charles Fourier prefigures our total refusal, refusal, points out that Fourier believed in short, civilization was a monstrosity that needed to be overcome. The US Surrealist movement agreed. Robin D. G. Kelly put it in Freedom Dreams, surrealism may have originated in the West, but it is rooted in a conspiracy against Western civilization. A detailed and inspired piece entitled A Phalansterian Inside the Magnetic Field, written by Guy Girard, surrealist painter and voice for contemporary surrealism Paris, writes in their journal El Chiringa, describing uh, surrealism's utopian ambitions, he writes, to renew a fascination with life, to recast morality and understanding, to strive for the greatest mental and social freedom, to imagine a civilization where desire is supreme, and to recognize in that civilization the project of surrealism epitomized. Gerard quotes Andre Breton, we do not accept the laws of economics or trade. We do not accept the slavery of work. And in a broader realm, we declare ourselves in insurrection against history. Ron Sikalski includes an entire chapter in his wonderful book, Dreams of Anarchy and Anarchy of Dreams, entitled Absolute Divergence. Online, I found Giraffe and Anti-Giraffe, Charles Fourier's Artistic Thinking by Lars Bang Larsons, reminding me of the scope of Fourier's imagination. Fourier admired the giraffe as hieroglyph of truth, thought that the relationships between humans and animals would be transformed, believed in a physical and social revolution that would lead to harmony. George Woodcock writes, in a few pages that describe de Jacques as advocating extreme action and the idea of secret society, but also constructed a utopia. Crowded cities gone, replaced by Cyclidians capable of holding a million people and total liberty of discussion, centralized working in humanospheres containing around 6,000 people. A great building with 12 radiating wings like an enormous starfish. Woodcock concludes that some of de Jacques' ideas probably influenced Kropotkin's conquest of bread. In Chicago, our, our own world surrealist exhibition, Marlon's Freedom, uh, had the theme of the worldwide inspiration of surrealism. There was no public money, no resources besides our own, but drawn together by a shared passional attraction, energy of youth and mad love for surrealism. This exhibition curated by Robert Greene was a wonderful success. Alan Artner compared it to the scene of an explosion. He was right, that is what it was. After considerable experience with work as a wage laborer, I wrote my own branch against work in my Surrealist Experiences book and pointed out, especially ingrained is working for someone else, producing wealth that someone else enjoys, thinking someone else's thoughts, dreaming someone else's dreams, for one's own dream of life has long been lost in the shuffle. Desire becomes a commodity like all others. Freedom Dreams, um, book by Robin D.G. Kelly begins, the history of social movements attracts me because it, what it might teach us about our present condition and how we might shape the future. Fourier's concept, Le Car Absolu, encompasses and provokes the idea of surrealist insurrection against history. 
We are our memories, we are our actions. We are memories of those actions. Writers and historians are involved in a great struggle. What is important in history and who is important? We have no use for the history we learned in school. <laughs> What's there is muddled propaganda. It's up to us to create a past worth having. No stifling national myths or superhero god fantasies. Find ancestors worth having, ideas worth saving, a world worth living in. The past is the crystal ball of the future. What do we want to see? Perhaps in a way we are the intelligence of Earth, as de Jacques suggested. Certainly what we do now matters. We bear the responsibility. Will all life deteriorate, poisoned by carelessness, or will we find a way out? In, this, in part three, de Jacques begins, man is essentially a revolutionary being. He does not know how to stay in place. He does not live the life of limits, but the life of the stars. Nature has given him movement and light in order to orbit and shine. Isn't the limit itself, though slow to move, transformed imperceptibly each day until it is entirely metamorphosed? So revolutionize yourself in order to preserve yourself. De Jacques had an unusual prediction for the future from 160 years ago, before cars, before telephones, before refrigerators, before the atomic age. He writes, the heavens have been scaled. Electricity carries man on its wings and leads him through the clouds, him in his aerial steamboats. It makes him cross in a few seconds spaces that would take entire months. The continents are quarters of a districts of a universal city. Monumental dwellings soar. The globe is like a park. Man holding the scepter of science in his hand has from now on the power we have previously attributed to God. Surrealists celebrate de Jacques on his 200th anniversary and are inspired by the same passion. 